Hello, a very good evening to the respected speakers, colleagues, and our dear students. I'm Shormila Sharkar, extending a warm welcome to you all for this evening's program on behalf of the organizers, Department of History, Oak Hill Memorial Girls College. We are happy to be here today to present our very first state level webinar, Public Health Epidemic and State, a Legacy of Colonial Bingo. Let me start this program by saying, so far, such discussions were held in large lecture theaters with speakers facing the audience and an expectant crowd gathered together. But today, every one of us, the speakers, the organizers, and the audience are participating from their own homes through technology. That is the new normal. A normal that emphasizes the graveness of the present situation. Situation that has brought the Greek word pandemic from the pages of history to our daily lives. In classrooms, we read about the scourges of plague in Greece and Rome. We learn about the devastations in Bengal caused by malaria and cholera. And now we are face to face with this worldwide COVID-19 crisis. Edmund Burke famously said, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. So with two days lessons learned, we hope to move forward and with this hope in our hearts and without further ado, let me request our principal, Dr. Otoshi Karpa, to please inaugurate today's proceedings. To you, Dr. Karpa. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to today's webinar arranged by the Department of History, Gokhale Memorial Girls College on public health epidemic and state, a legacy of colonial being. Seminars are the usual modes of academic exchange. But due to the worldwide spread of coronavirus, this lockdown period is marked by a set of changes. And most important of them is the adaptation to technology. Technology has opened up, has, op uh, has helped us to stay together despite the socially alienating forces of the pandemic. This webinar is an outcome of that desire to stay together, and I hope it will help to push the boundaries of human knowledge to a significant extent. We have with us two eminent speakers, Professor Aurobindo Shamunto and Professor Shujata Mukherjee, and I thank them for sparing their valuable time for today's webinar. I also thank the professors of the Department of History and also the participants all over the country who have registered their names in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words. I now invite our head of the department, Prashanta Kumar Pal, to say a few words, introducing our first speaker for the session, Professor Aurobindo Shamant. A very good evening to our respected colleagues, distinguished professors, my dear students, and all the history lovers from different parts of India. I am Prashanto Kumar Pal, an assistant professor of history of Gokhil Memorial Girls College, Kolkata. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Aurobindo Shamanto as the guest speaker for the first session of our webinar on public health epidemics and state, a legacy of colonial Bengal. Dr. Shamanto will speak on different differing pers uh, perceptions of epidemics in colonial Bengal. Dr. Shamanto is former professor of uh, history at the University of Vardwan, West Bengal. He has been a prolific writer on social aspect of epidemics and medicine in colonial India. I have a lengthy list of uh, the publications of Dr. Shamanto and I feel it will be crime for me if I don't share some of them with you. Uh, mainly, I want to mention the uh, malarial fever in colonial Bengal, social history of an epidemic. Uh, the text uh, has emphasized on the social aspect of malarial fever in colonial Bengal. Dr. Shamanto emphasized the 
social responses of different classes of colonial Bengal. At the same time, he examined the role played by colonial, so colonial government of Dadan Bengal. Dr. Shamanto wrote another text on epidemics of Bengal. It is living with epidemics in colonial Bengal. I personally believe the text is very relevant with the current circumstances of the world. As Professor Sarkar already has been mentioned that the whole world is fighting against coronavirus, against COVID-19, and still we have no any solutions in our hands. And uh, we know that our distinguished physicians, doctors, medical scientists are trying their level best to find out the solution. But until the invention of the uh, antivirus of COVID-19, we have to live with this coronavirus. We have to live with this epidemic disease, the unseen enemy of the world. Dr. Shamanto is equally prolific in Bengali. He wrote some Bengali books on epidemics, disease, natural calamities, and environmental issues. I want to mention some of them. Initially, he wrote Prakritik Viparjaya Manush and Rog Rogi Ebong Rastro. Dr. Shamanto has been a fellow at Jakir Hussain Center for Educational Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru's uh, University, near Delhi. At the same time, he has been a fellow at the Welcome Cent Trust Center for History of Medicine, London, UK. It is very tough for me to brief the academic career uh, of Dr. Shamanto within a few minutes. So I would like to request Dr. Shamanto to deliver his lecture on differing perceptions of epidemics in colonial Bengal. And I request you all to pay your full attention to Dr. Shamanto. And if you have any queries, any questions, please write it down in your chat box. We will try to forward it to Dr. Shamanto after the end of both lectures. Thank you all. Welcome Dr. Shamanto, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Prashantu, for your generous introduction to me. Uh, let me begin with uh, thanking the organizers of this webinar for inviting me uh, and uh, giving me an opportunity to share with you some of my ideas about differing perceptions of epidemics in colonial Bengal. Now, the plurality of the category epidemic is a bit troubling me. There are uh, as many as four major epidemics which gripped colonial Bengal with alarming mortality, namely malaria, smallpox, cholera, and plague. Now, popular perceptions used to differ from one epidemic to another. Perceptions also differed from one place to another. Perceptions differed at different point of time. So I'm a little bit intrigued uh, how to engage in such spatial and temporal differences in a single frame, uh, in a single uh, lecture, given the time constraint. There is still another problematic. We can identify at least, uh, you say, uh, four components among the category of people, say one, ordinary people, two, the rural gentry class, three, middle class intelligentsia, and finally, the indigenous medical practitioners who, are, who were based in the villages. Now, considering the time constraint, I would like to concentrate uh, only on one epidemic that is malaria, and engage in at least two components of people, that is ordinary people and the rural gentry. Now, when the widespread epidemic malaria started taking its toll in the 1860s, you know, it broke out in Burdwan, 
in 1862 uh, and from there it disseminated all over Bengal. Now at the time popular reaction in Bengal did not differ sharply from that in other parts of the country. In fact, the identification of epidemic disease with divine wrath or divine anger was almost a pan-Indian phenomenon. It took the distinctive form of belief in disease deities, especially goddesses. Hindu society, uh, which has rightly been observed by uh, Professor David Arnold, did not regard all diseases alike. Some are seen as consequence of uh, personal sins, others the result of sorcery. But you know, epidemic diseases, due to their scale and nature, and the general ineffectiveness of conventional medicine against them, were readily identified with the wrath of gods and cosmic disharmony. In fact, most of the disease goddesses were associated with a particular disease or ailment. In Bengal, the principal deity was Sheetala, as you all know, the goddess of uh, smallpox. The worship of Sheetala was time to coincide with the beginning of smallpox season. In Delta Bengal, the specific cholera deity was called Ola Bibi by the Muslims and Ola Chandi by the Hindus. Most interestingly, however, the people did not interpret malaria epidemic as a heavenly intervention. And consequently, one finds no socially acclaimed folk deity for fever epidemic, except, of course, the cult of Jorashura prevalent among the lower classes of people. Though it has been argued that fever demon or Jorashura is present in the textualized classical traditions, it appears all the more certain from the contemporary literary imagination that only the marginalized castes invoke Jarasura with the help of the Brahmin during malady epidemics so that individuals and groups may recover. Jarasura was in fact never venerated or worshipped like other uh, disease deities for the simple reason that he was a demon, that is Oshura, and not a deity or Debo as, as such. People worship, you know, Debos or Godheads out of reverence or fear. Asura is invoked out of irreverence or disrespect. However, uh, apart from the usual offerings of rice, sweets, and fruits, goats were sometimes sacrificed in special instances for invoking Jara Asura. This being seems to have had no following among the upper caste Hindus or well-to-do villagers. Nowhere in the contemporary literary work or in the official record could one find the reference to any widespread worship of this particular godhead. In other words, this disease deity, unlike Sheetala or Ola Bibi, never became a cult in Bengali society. This provides an interesting exception to David Arnold's general observation that almost all epidemics in India are associated with a particular disease deity. And these call for an explanation. The explanation, I believe, may be twofold. <coughs> First, the lack of indigenous immunity. And second, the exceptional geographical range of the disease. The causes of malarial fever and quinine, its supposed herbal remedy, were not known to people till the advent of the 20th century. Until then, people short solace in the popular adage, which is, what is that? That that which cannot be ended should be mended, and which could not even be mended should be accommodated within the regular pattern of life. Moreover, malarial fever might be remittent or intermittent. It abated at intervals. Its habit of periodic invasion provided the patient temporary respite from fever, and this helped reduce the fear of it to some extent. Besides, this type of ailment was not unknown to the people. The affliction had accompanied them from cradle to coffin, so that the disease had lost much of its 
SOC element. Secondly, epidemic malaria lost much of its age due to its widespread spatial expansion. It traveled from Assam to Amritsar, from Bombay to Bengal. It was not an isolated ailment afflicting a particular person or two. Particularly in Bengal, few districts you know could escape its ravages. The epidemic became an almost national phenomenon visiting different regions simultaneously. Thus, there prevailed an attitude of helpless resignation to conventional treatment, and the epidemic was scarcely regarded as a sign of divine intervention or divine displeasure. Thus, worship or propitiation of a particular godhead was ruled out. On the contrary, people accused the colonial government of arbitrary interference with the river system in eastern India and consequently bringing about a virulent epidemic. Railway embankments, people argued, had converted large tracts of fertile land into perpetual swamps. Increasing the number of embankments and railways reduced the chances of flood and inundation. And the reduced chances of flood meant progressive loss of alluvial soil. The consequences, people argued, were generally twofold. First, impeded drainage brought in its train large number of stagnant pools and marshes, uh, which were the breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And second, loss of fertility of soil due to cessation of inundation had diminished the quantum of winter harvest, which meant starvation for a sizable section of the rural masses. The government, they complained, was in no mood to adapt uh, uh, effective measures to drain out rivers, particularly the river Damodar. Though the people lamented acts of omission, they protested against rulers' acts of commission as well. Since many of the affected villages became particularly overgrown with tangled vegetation, government officials pleaded for cutting up superfluous tree growth in the vicinity of the dwelling houses. So the government was well-intentioned, so to say. But some of the overzealous officials resorted to measures that virtually denuded the villages of their greenery. They chopped up branches, trimmed the shrubs short, and worst of all, uprooted the larger trees, particularly the fruit-bearing trees. The high-handedness of the officials never went unprotested. People in the affected villages, particularly in Jessore district, were up in arms when government officials approached the village with people, with, uh, with the uh, men, to execute government orders. Interested with the unpleasant task of pulling down large trees, officials had to beat hastily street. They also encouraged similar, uh, encountered similar resistance from villages when the government opened up longer khanna or gruel kitchen in the immediate vicinity of the affected villages. When the government first introduced a relief house at Barwan, People opposed the system of giving cooked food on religious grounds and sarcastically called it hotel. The Hindus certainly did not approve of the idea of cooked food being distributed. Uh, particularly the upper caste Hindus thought it preposterous to join the quote-unquote lowly crowd of armed receivers. The method of food distribution, too, added insult to injury. Each individual was furnished a printed ticket which entitled him or her to receive the stipulated amount of food relief. The recipient, it was admitted by the government officials, generally consisted of the lower caste people, most women and children of humble social origin. Nevertheless, the Muslims seem to have no inhibition with cooked food. For at least at one depot I have observed, that is in, at Nilpur, they were keen to receive the relief provided by the Langar Khanna. Now, popular protest to public health measures in terms of cutting trees was thus noticeable. Opposition to the provision of food relief was also discernible, but opposition to government dispensaries was seldom noticed. The government opened up fever hospitals and free uh, fever dispensaries in the affected areas and provided quinine free of cost to the sick. People are very much people very often complained of the irregular supply of adulterated quinine 
initially the people seem to be rather indifferent to such statements partly because the doctors in charge are mostly unconcerned about treatment or irregular in their attendance gradually however these institutions become popular and an increasing number of patients constituting a crowd so to say would collect at the outpatient department statistical evidences from hospital in calcutta as also in the amalgamated portion of its suburbs and in howrah indicate as many as 2 lakh 8073 visited hospitals in one year only that is 1890 the intensity of malaria and the consequent hospitalization of the afflicted thus if who little or no resistance from the masses this stood in sharp contrast to the phenomenon of plague epidemic in bombay the physical examination of travelers and the residents of plague struck towns and cities hospitalization segregation produce enormous alarm and people oppose the measure to thunnel because most of the inspecting doctors were male and european their touch was considered either polluting or tantamount to sexual molestation when it involved the examination of women's necks armpits and thighs david andol dwells on the repugnance of the oriental bodies on to western medicine for reasons religious and social the loud protest against subjection to european uh, doctors examination and finally the mitigation of hart's government measure to placate the turbulent circumstances neither of this sort happened in bengal when initially the company and then the crown resorted to a social segregation by way of internment in hospital and doling out western medicine through public distribution system such as dispensaries and post offices in the case of plague people considered it as an expression of divine wrath many indians saw the plague as a form of divine punishment a visitation against which the use of western medicine was bound to be either impious or ineffective but malaria unlike the plague was never interpreted as a divine in, uh, intervention far less a punishment by the heavenly hand in collective imagination its virulence was associated with the baneful effects of british colonial policy people are good that since the government had started up the disease none but the government should take responsibility of remedying the situation second treatment of malarial fever <coughs> with indigenous medicine provoked uh, proved to be ineffective in most cases death was hastened by injudicious treatment from ignorant and unqualified native practitioners <coughs> government officials believed that the dreadful mortality was due due primarily to wrong treatment by the kabirajas and people as such were increasingly losing faith in their treatment at the same time the people admitted the efficacy of european medicine in sharp contrast to the tardy and uncertain cure under the native system thereupon opposition to western medicine was a question nevertheless when the epidemic fear fever first struck bengal countryside particularly people were filled with consternation and dismay gradually the fever traveled from one end of the district to another killing some of the some and leaving others shattered in body and soul people had never seen so many deaths so many people die in their villages in so little time funeral processions were with the ritualistic chanting of hari stalked the countryside every day the funeral pyres at the burning ghats were never put out when the mortal remains of one person were reduced to ashes those of another were ready for cremation elderly inhabitants confessed that they had never seen such a terrible vegetation from nearly every house the cry of lamentation could be heard only when the government started sending out native doctors trained in western medicine and opened up charitable dispensaries particularly charitable fever dispensaries did public uh, fear gradually subside available evidences indicate that poorer peasants refused to move out of their homestead to much healthier districts even in period of high malaria mortality government officials could hardly induce the villagers 
to leave their family residence, the Bhadrashran Bhati, in which were installed the family deities and the guardians of the spirits of their ancestors. Migration to healthier places, particularly to Calcutta, the capital city, was, however, very common among the well to do families, particularly among the Jamindars. Now, the brings us to the perceptions of the rural gentry. How did rural gentry uh, view this uh, huge mortality? Unlike the plague, malaria was severe in the countryside, where, not unlike Madras, little malarial operations had been taken up by the government. So it is worthwhile to notice how the gentry reacted to the proliferation of the disease. The attitude of the better of peasants, smaller jamindars, and other wealthy influential to the fever epidemic was more or less practical, and the method they evolved to circumvent it was pragmatic. They were not necessarily fatalist, and they did not worship Jorasuro either. They used to call on the village kabirajos or um, by those, failing which they looked for better cures in Calcutta. They could visit the government dispensaries attended by local doctors practicing Western medicine. And as a last resort, they could leave the affected village for good and settle in the city. This was more or less common with the Jamindars. When the government resorted to clearing forest in an attempt to destroy the habitat of mosquitoes, the better off and the more influential natives proved to be the most troublesome. They were opposed to such operations and tried by every means to incite the villagers to see to it that such measures were never carried out. Conspicuous among them was the manager of Prashanna Kumar Tagore's estate. Government officials believed that it was solely due to his influence and advice that so much uh, opposition was encountered. The government was compelled to abandon the work altogether. Other Jamindars followed suit. In fact, the officials found it intriguing that when the sole object of how to do good to the people, to the sick and suffering, obstacles were raised in the most unexpected quarter. I quote from the uh, government report. The administration expected the Jamindar to play an active and more meaningful role. Even the people hoped that the Jamindars would come forward with bountiful aid as relief for the riots. Should the pigeons die, they are good. Agriculture will suffer and revenue would fall. There are, of course, some exceptions. The Maharaja Badwan and Jaya Krishna Mukherjee of Uttarpara did come forward to help their subject. To the Maharaja Badwan, the government was indebted for almost entirely defraying the cost of fever dispensaries that was established in Badwan for several years. Besides, he made a large donation towards provisional relief to the people who had suffered from the ravages of fever in his hometown, Badwan. Jai Krishna Mukherjee also persistently prodded the government to impress upon them the need for immediate action and under his own supervision that he improved irrigation and the supply of drinking water in his uh, residence, Darvashini. His initiative and ingenuity in this respect attracted the interested attention of several other Jamindars who had hitherto neglected the provision of clean drinking water to the riots was greatly annoyed with the ineptitude of the government in handling the malaria question and deplored the tendency of the government engineers to ignore the collective wisdom of local people based on observation and experiences. Nevertheless, the fact remains that most of Bengal uh, Jamindars were apathetic to the general welfare of their riots and more so in matters of public health and hygiene. Most of them had neither the inclination not the means to undertake such work. This was purely because, this was partly because their income from land was dwindling under the revised government demand from time to time. In fact, most of the Jamindars were contending with the, contending with grudge that in many cases, uh, they had not been allowed a margin of more than 5% uh, of the total revenue collection, including establishment charges. Nor was there, they are good, any stipulation in the contract of permanent settlement about irrigation works. If the response of the Jamindars as a class was generally hostile and their reactions skin deep, their science 
seemed more concerned, and some newly educated middle class gentry found the epidemic fever a cause to fight with. Some major characters in the novels of Sarochandra Chattopadhyay, you know, Agra dated it here, well known for his empathy for the unlettered and poor villagers, will illustrate my point. Ramesh in Polli Samaj, Brindavan in Pandit Mashar, and Srikanto in Srikanto uh, took to eradicate diseases like malaria, cholera, and plague from the countryside. Some of the novels of Tarashankar Bandhapadhyay depict the concern of Jamindar's sons about the epidemic. In Gono Devata, for instance, Debu, a scion of a well to do family, imbibed philanthropy and plunged headlong into movement for eradicating diseases from the ailing masses. Again, in Dhatri Devata, Srinath is an archetypal member of the rural gentry who proved to be a good Samaritan fighting epidemics and also social injustice. The imaginative reconstruction of the novelist find unwitting corroboration in local literary tra tracts of the period. Contemporary drama depicted the worry of the educated middle class about the suffering caused by malaria. Realizing the attitude of the government, a number of public-spirited youth started anti-malaria societies to raise money to which a contribution to the government had been added. Jila's youth sought to organize anti-malaria cooperative societies in affected villages, which undertook various sanitary measures to improve public health. With the help of this fund, they organized branch societies in the malaria-stricken villages of Bengal. Now, uh, I think a few tentative conclusions can be drawn from all these. Response to malaria epidemic from different so sections of society followed neither a homogeneous nor a unilinear trajectory, so to say. Differences stem from their widely differential perceptions of the epidemic. Generally speaking, the response of the masses was one of stoic acceptance and not a, not a dreaded repulsion. There is, however, nothing new in this kind of attitude. For an epidemic as such, uh, this had never been looked upon as a frightening disease in Bengal. It has all along been depicted in Bengali folklore as a living entity, often described as a cute girl who delights in frequenting village hearts, and although often despised by the wealthy landlord, is in fact invited by the impoverished uh, peasant families. On a general note, the reaction to the prophylactic intervention and the public health measures became rigid over a period of time. It followed more or less a uniform pattern everywhere with marginal variation. Almost all sections of society looked at the colonial government and the policies with suspicion and disbelief. The acquisition was sometimes violent, sometimes muted. Reputed doctors held the rulers responsible for the epidemic while blaming the people for their apathy to personal health and hygiene. They constructed the epidemic from uh, a purely medical perception, which was an error in their judgment. They could have realized that the struggle against disease must begin with war against bad government. That's all. Thank you very much for your question. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Shamundo, for your very interesting and informative insights. I'm sure the audience has many questions for you. Already I can see two questions. Now I request Shonjukta De, one of our junior colleagues, to introduce Professor Shujata Mukherjee. Thank you so much, Shonila, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all uh, to our webinar, the second half of the second session organized by Department of History, Gokhale Memorial Girls College. Today, we are very happy to have Dr. Shujata Mukherjee, an eminent historian and research scholar with us. I would like to invite you, ma'am, on behalf of our department, and thank you so much for joining us in this evening. But before we begin, I'd like to say a couple of words about Dr. Mukherjee. 
as we all know that she is currently working as a professor in the department of history robindro bharati university but not only that she once worked as a former dean of the arts faculty and former director center for gandhian studies robindro bharati university kolkata india she was the iccr visiting chair for modern indian studies at victoria university wellington new zealand between the month of july and october in the year 2016 Dr Mukherjee was awarded Wellcome Trust postdoctoral research grant London UK and was also worked as a Rockefeller fellow at the Rockefeller Archive Center Sleepy Hollow New York US in the year 2018 as we all know that professor mukherjee served as visiting fellow and visiting professor in different eminent educational institutions like JNU specifically Zakir Hussain Center for Educational Studies New Delhi the indian institute of science in the department of center for contemporary studies bangalore vishwa bharati university of shantiniketan and of course northeastern hill university shigong she teaches various streams of history like gender history women history history of ideas history of science technology medicine environment social history of modern india in one word i must say ma'am magnificent Her book-length publication include Gandhian views on education, which she have been edited. Another book named Life and Ideas of Vijay Krishna Goswami, where she worked as a co-author. One of her most famous books named Situating Tagore's Environmentalism, Environmental Degradation, and Rabindranath's Activism, published from Germany, Lambert Academic Publishing House, in the year 2012. and her latest authored book is titled gender medicine and society in colonial india women's health care in 19th and early 20th century bengal published by oxford university press 2017 and currently ma'am is working on history of epidemics and pandemics and ma'am uh, another time thank you so much for giving us your valuable time and um, today she will speak on public health and pandemics in colonial bengal so without further ado let's begin ma'am over to you now thank you thank you a very good evening to all of you and namaskar uh, i first should like to thank the organizers of this conference the gokhil memorial girls college for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to share some of my views thoughts and researches on history of pandemics and health care with a focus on uh, modern bengal now uh, as we all know covid-19 pandemic has caused widespread fear and alarm throughout the world however this is not the first time that modern world is witnessing such pandemic and health crisis arising out of it in fact modern world has passed through such crisis uh, in the last century and century before that as well by revisiting the history of uh, these pandemics perhaps we can understand whether and how far we can take certain measures at institutional level and personal level also uh, for coping up with the present crisis now uh, about british india and bengal which is going to be the focus of my talk today uh, we know and as has been pointed out by our dear speaker as well that severe outbreaks of epidemics of cholera smallpox plague um kalas or or black water fever and other diseases uh leading to widespread mortality and morbidity happen today i have chosen to throw light on two significant pandemic experiences of the 19th and 20th century faced by the world with a focus on the experience of colonial india and bengal one is the cholera pandemic of the 19th century and the other one is the influenza pandemic or spanish flu as it was called of 1918 20 
This presentation is divided into three sections. In the first section, I will be talking about the cholera pandemic and the issues which I am going to cover is uh, the origin and spread of this pandemic. What are the different uh, theories and arguments and views about that? Also about the uh, mortality arising out of it and uh, who suffered most during this pandemic experience. In the next uh, section, I will talk about the public health measures adopted by the colonial authorities to cope up with the crisis of cholera, pandemic and epidemic. And in the final section, I will analyze uh, the Spanish history of Spanish flu or influenza epidemic and other issues related to it. So now, first of all, about this cholera uh, pandemic outbreak. First, about when it happened, we see that it started in the year 1817 and continued throughout the 19th century. It attacked various parts of the world in six waves. The first wave started, as I said, in 1817 and continued till 1823. From India, it also uh, gradually spread to the Middle East, or it can be said that simultaneously it occurred uh, in India, Middle East, Russia, Europe, African continent, and the American continent. In the East, it advanced to Southeast Asia, China, the Korean Peninsula, and Japan. Globally speaking, different dates for these waves of pandemics can be given as first wave from 1817 to 1823. Second one started in 1826, continued till 1837. And again, it came back in 1846, which lasted in different phases till 1862 and just two years after that it recurred in 1864 continued till 1875 then again in the next decade from 1883 it continued till 1894 and the last wave started around 1899 and continued till 1923. now of course in all these waves, all the countries were not affected equally. In some places it, places, it was severe. In some places, it was not so severe. Now, uh, about the origin, we find that there are more, uh, two theories about the origin and the spread. Now, when uh, it of course, it started in Bengal in 1817 in Jesore, the town of Jesore in the district of Jesore, Joshore Jela, Joshore Sahore, uh, which is now in Bangladesh. The civil surgeon reported the virulent outbreak of this cholera uh, epidemic. From there, it spread to Calcutta and very quickly it spread to other parts of Bengal. And then it played havoc in the northern part of India and in Western India. Then we see that around 1830-32, it broke out in the continent of Europe, along with England. However, England actually uh, controlled more of this, less this pandemic by 1870. Now, one interesting thing is that when it traveled to Europe, the Europeans called it Asiatic cholera or Indian cholera. And the Europeans then blamed the Indians for their filthy habits uh, and their, their insanitary conditions 
and their habitual contempt for sanitation for causing dissemination of this uh, disease. That's why they called it Asiatic cholera. And also India was regarded as the homeland of cholera. Now, this view was uh, challenged by the contemporaries, no less than a person like Dr. Mohendra Lal Sirkar, who is a very famous, well-known Bengali doctor. He wrote around 1904 that this term, Asiatic cholera, and viewing called, uh, Bengal as the homeland of cholera is untenable. It was pointed out that Europe also faced cholera earlier. And from the 1960s onwards, the researchers have emphatically argued time and again that two things. First of all, they said that it was not the insanitary condition and contempt for sanitation by the Indians that was responsible for causing cholera. In fact, cholera was spread and disseminated through uh, and by European travelers, European traders, and by European troop movements. Secondly, it was also pointed out uh, that the germ which caused cholera in Bengal and India was not the same strain of bacteria which caused uh, cholera to happen in um, other parts of the world. So these are two different strains of bacteria. Now, it is very difficult to prove which one is totally correct. But at least this can be said that uh, there is some logic in the argument that European troops and European traders cause dissemination of the cholera germ for the reason that the army barracks where the European troops were stationed were very unhygienic. Uh, and the soldiers also became uh, victims of several, I mean, the Indi uh, British Indian soldiers became victims of uh, outbreaks of uh, cholera and other epidemics time and again. Uh, again, we see that the European traders, for example, the Portuguese. In Goa, there, there was outbreak of cholera as early as 15 uh, 16th century, like 1503 and so on. And from Portu, uh, from Goa, Portuguese traders came to Bengal also in Shoptogram and other regions, Chittagong and other regions. So there is a possibility that they also spread the germs, carried the germs here and spread the germs. And definitely can be said that the army who were staying in the barracks in a very unsanitary, insanitary condition, they caused this infection to spread further when they went to local bazaars and uh, the local villages, they were in touch with local villages. So there is some merit in this argument. Now, about the mortality, we see that, uh, well, we are not uh, very sure because you know the statistics are not really uh, totally reliable, but still it can be mentioned for whatever is, it is worth that uh, in, uh, in India from 1817 uh, till uh, more or less around 1860s, it can be said that 15, around 15 million cholera deaths happened in British India. And from 1865 to 1947, 25 million died of cholera. Death registration actually started in British India in uh, 1868. And for Bengal, we did this figure that from 1868 to around 1880s, there was death from cholera. It rose from 39,643 to 1,96,590. So you see, this is a very steep rise. And Bengal countryside actually experienced cholera outbreaks in uh, like four or, in four or five years gap throughout the uh, 19th century. Now, 
one has to remember that germ theory of disease actually developed since the 1880s. Before that, people were not sure, even the medical authorities were not sure which bacteria or whether it was a bacteria caused disease or whether it was caused by environment, etc., etc. Although there was a theory which was propagated by John Snow, a British bacteriologist, a British doctor in 1848, that cholera was a waterborne disease. But that was not accepted by the medical communities everywhere. So the measures they had to follow was, as we know, in the COVID days, the quarantines. Sometimes they uh, put uh, maritime quarantines, quarantines on the traders and also on general people. That measure was adopted, but not so for the British India. About that, I will talk later. Now, who were affected? Which section of the people were most affected? Uh, in Bengal and in India. First, we see that cholera became very widespread among the British soldiers. It really caused panic among the imperial authorities. From 1818 to 1854, approximately 8,500 cholera deaths occurred among British soldiers. But later on, it was uh, combated. I mean, later it dropped. How? I will talk about later. Now, poor Indians and slum, that is slum dwellers in the urban areas and the poor villages, they suffered most. And cholera came to be called the disease of the poor. Now, what about the measures taken to combat this uh, epidemic in India and in Bengal? At the outset, I would like to point out that colonial medical establishment and public health care infrastructure, which developed in colonial India and Bengal, always prioritized the health needs of the army. Whatever funds, limited funds they were ready to spend was for preserving and protecting army health. Now, two types of initiatives were taken in the public health sphere. The first, curative medicine and preventive healthcare measures. For curative medicine, about the hospitals and dispensaries, they grew up from early 18th century to serve the needs of the European army and European civilian population. Like Presidency General Hospital was built up in Calcutta in 1768 to treat European patients. Indian Medical Service was uh, started in 1764, that too, to look after European health in India. And the Indians got its first hospital established by the East India Company in 1792, which was called Native General Hospital. What about the treatment? Was there any uh, outright treatment for cholera? There was no outright cure. Now, when uh, epidemic started in 1817, in Calcutta, it was most widespread in the black town areas. Now, uh, then, interestingly, government issued a memorandum uh, where uh, it was said that the Western practitioners uh, could use for treating cholera patients by, uh, by applying common liquors and ether to restore strength and energy. And uh, the Kabirajas and the Hakims, they were advised to use uh, indigenous methods. So there was a prescription of a combination of therapy from Western and Indian medical system. Now, this was not uncommon during the early phase of colonial rule. All these changed later. I mean, after 1835, we see that the Calcutta Medical College was established and then the official patronage to Indian medicine was withdrawn. And it was pointed out that only Western medical system was based on scientific medicine. So the age-old Indian therapeutic system and the practitioners were deprived from official patronage. They continued to survive only on the basis of their own initiatives. In 1835, Calcutta Medical College started, and in 1854, uh, its first hospital was started, their cholera patients were treated. And uh, here also we see uh, racial discrimination, you know. In native wars, the situation was really bad. It was very unclean, whereas the European wars were very clean. Hygiene was maintained there. 
so obviously the cholera patients who got admitted in the native wards died in large numbers about preventive measures we see that a uh, royal commission was appointed in 1859 to inquire about the sanitary state of the indian army now um, we see that in 1864 its report came and it recommended that measures should be taken to improve hygienic condition among the army and accordingly the hygiene and sanitary condition of army barracks was improved a lot and there we see that there was drop in cholera mortality among the army now for general population only piecemeal measures were taken to control cholera now you see there were two types of theories among the medical men in india british doctors one was that cholera was caused by miasma or uh, bad air and also cholera was caused by uh, climatic changes like sudden sudden drop in temperature etc there is also another theory which is called pilgrim theory that pilgrims uh, and uh, uh, the pilgrimage sites and religious festival sites because of insanitary conditions saw outbreak of epidemic like cholera and the pilgrims when they were coming back to their villages from the pilgrimage sites they spread the continue to spread cholera infection throughout the route this is called the pilgrim theory now interestingly the in the sanitary um, conference which was held in venice in 1866 in international sanitary conference it pointed out that the pilgrims were uh, really responsible and it also said that quarantine measures should be taken to combat this disease in uh, different parts of the world including india but whereas different european countries adopted quarantine measures british england was against maritime quarantine and so was british indian government the sanitary commissioners and others then uh, actually said that cholera was not a contagious disease it was spread only by foul air so there is no need for quarantine actually the british were against quarantines because for example maritime quarantine would hamper trade so that would mean fall in income so they did not want to impose quarantine maritime quarantine there were in certain places like individuals were put in quarantines but not in any great measure actually in combating cholera we see that the british uh, authority in india and in bengal took a non interventionist stand you know and the imperial authority they passed laws from time to time to keeping in mind the needs of protecting the army health but we see that in the villages which suffered most due to different epidemics including cholera the responsibility was actually passed on to the local authorities and from 1881 there were district boards which were uh, to uh, raise their own uh, resources by taxing people for maintaining hygiene for maintaining the supply of good uh, drinking water and for taking any other uh, health measures along with other developmental measures and obviously the local boards could not really impose a lot of revenues and taxes on the poor villagers that was not practical so there was always shortage of funds for the local boards and the imperial authorities thus actually uh, just uh did was not ready to take up the responsibility and on the other hand the local boards district boards they are always facing this problem of uh fund and shortage of good stuff so obviously the health of the villagers continued to suffer throughout the uh british period um there were very few dispensaries and hospitals which worked for cholera patients and on the other hand preventive health measures like providing safe drinking water in improving hygiene also fell far short of what was needed to prevent cholera 
On the other hand, the British continued to blame the primitive ideas of Indian people with rigor to the sanitation, but actually poor healthcare facilities were to be blamed. Now, anti-cholera uh, vaccination came around 1892, developed by W.M. Hafkin, a Russian bacteriologist, but it remained confined to soldiers, prisoners, and tea garden workers. So this was the state of the public health when the Spanish flu broke out in 1918. It started in Bombay. Now, as we know that COVID-19 came from outside, Spanish flu also came from outside through troop movements. That uh, A group of uh, European soldiers who were serving in, uh, uh, British soldiers who were serving in war front, uh, war front, uh, we see that they came back to Bombay, they landed in Bombay, and from June they carried the flu germs, and from June it became spreading, it spread, did spread in Bombay. And the first wave, Spanish flu actually came in three waves. The first wave started in uh, June, continued to July, August, second wave started in September, continued till November, and final phase came in next year, 1918. Now, Spanish flu was playing havoc all around the world. It is estimated that 500 million people got infected uh, all over the world, and about 50 to 100 million died. About British India also, you know, during wartime, the, not, uh, the uh, registration and those uh, things were not working properly, still, uh, it has been guessed that from 12 million to 18 million people in British India died of this flu. Now, comparatively, Calcutta suffered less mortality because when the disease traveled from uh, Western India to Calcutta during September and November, it perhaps lost some of its virulence. That is why we know about it. But at least it was it was playing havoc, and in the villages, at least uh, nothing could be done much. Whereas Calcutta municipality was taking certain measures, but ultimately, you know, the picture which we get, we don't get much uh, information about Spanish flu. We know about the mortality. There are certain mortality studies, but we know certain things that. It uh, affected people belonging to the age group of 20 to 40, which is very, uh, very different from what generally happens, you know, because the older people get affected by this sort of uh, contagious diseases, but it was different. And in India, female population suffered from uh, more than male population. This is against what was the general trend all over the world. Um, so uh, Spanish flu was really a very, I mean, played havoc with uh, all the healthcare system and everything. And so many people died that there was not enough firewood to burn the dead bodies. So the Ganges and other rivers, they got clogged with uh, the rivers. Uh, the dead bodies are floating in the rivers. Uh, so you, you can understand what uh, body site it was. Uh, so. Okay, so uh, now I uh, think I should wind up. And just one thing I would like to mention about Spanish flu is that it is called Spanish flu, but it did not origin in Spain, originate in Spain. And it is not, its origin is a mystery. It was first reported by the uh, Madrid press because the other press, they wanted to cover due to wartime censored this uh, 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 flu. They did not report it, but Spain was neutral. Spain reported it. Spain thought it came from uh, France. So it, they call it French flu. But it occurred in America also, North America and other parts of America and other uh, countries of the world. But it is, and of course it is, it can be, uh, uh, said very certainly that it got spread due disseminated due to the due to the yes this is the you see this is uh, the mask the spanish blue we are we can 
really find similarities like COVID days. Now, nowadays, what we are passing through. The doctors were wearing uh, ma masks. Next picture, please. There are other pictures also. Can those be sh uh, shown? Next, next picture. And uh, this is a picture from America. Actually, uh, Indian archives is very poor. I mean, we don't get uh, this sort of information like what preventive measures were taken. But all over the world, we see that very much like today, what we are facing today, like wearing the mask, not spitting in the public, those were advised uh, as preventive measures. So OK, now uh, I come to the end of my um, talk today. Just another thing I would like to point out that the British um, healthcare facilities suffered from several drawbacks including the factor that it did not really was not designed to serve the Indian people. And secondly, another glaring defect was that it totally neglected, the officially totally neglected the indigenous therapies, which remained a major drawback because the majority of the people could not really get hold of Western medicine. They had to depend on indigenous therapies and even folk healers and quacks as well. So it's the healthcare measures really fail to take care of the health of the poor villages and majority of Indian people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for your wonderful share. We were transported to another century for the past hour and a half. And now we come to the question answer session. Now here, please let me tell you one thing. There has been lots of questions, some of them very relevant. Some of them are similar. So what we have done is uh, we have kind of uh, locked together the questions so that you can answer them together. And some of the questions you've already answered in your lecture, but still, uh, First, uh, as I said, for the lack of time, we had to pick and choose. If your questions have not been selected for answering, yet you have some comment that you'd like to share with the speakers, I'm telling this to the audience, or if you have a question to ask, a specific question that you feel I have missed out on, please fill up the feedback form, specifically question number two, and the speakers would be duly notified. Without wasting time, let me read out the questions as far as I was able to follow. Now, it is possible that I've got the names a little mixed up. Please don't mind that. But uh, first, I'll address uh, Professor Shamunto. Sir, uh, Topun Kumar Khan, I think, from Burdwan University. I'm not quite sure of the name. I'm sorry if I've made a mistake. But the question, I've got, got it right. Uh, he is uh, studying about the boatmen of Bingo. And he wants to know that uh, how far uh, were these boatmen of Bengal were affected by the malarial fever. And uh, were any separate steps taken to deal with their specific problem? That is one question for you, sir. I'll give you the second question so that you can kind of think about it and answer them together. Another question is that Orup Deep, he has said, he has asked rather that leprosy is also an infectious disease and it also spreads very fast uh, in such countries as India. And uh, was that ever a concern of the colonial state? These are the two questions for you, sir. Uh, well, but I could get a first question. Who are the people he is talking about? Who were affected by malarial fever? Who? Uh, uh, sir, I'll repeat. Yes. I'll repeat the Repetit. question. Topun Kumar hmm. Khan of Burdwan University. 
Yeah, that I have heard. Tapan Thana Burdwan University. He is uh, working with the boatmen of Bengal. Boatmen, okay. okay. Boatmen of Bengal. And he wants to know whether the aerial fever was uh, specially affected them and how did the state deal with it? Did the, did the state deal with it separately as a separate issue or what? So did you get the question? Well, yeah, 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 I, I have got no, the question the properly. Uh, but uh, sorry to tell you that uh, I don't have any, uh, you know, specific answer to this question. Uh, I have inquired about the impact of malaria on different uh, group of population, particularly on the, uh, you know, uh, the potters, you know, the carpenters, you know, garland makers. But nowhere in official records or in Bengali literary imaginative text did I find any reference to the impact of malaria on the board makers. Uh, that might be a, a very interesting inquiry. I, I don't have any answer to that. I, I don't know. To be, I, Sorry to confess. And about the second question, I think this is not specifically related to malaria. This is an entirely different question about the leprosy. Yes, the colonial government did address the leprosy question, particularly in, in uh, Purulia district. But much better was the measure taken by the Christian missionaries. Uh, the colonial government didn't have much to uh, uh, undertake about the amelioration of the condition of the lepers. It was uh, mostly the measures taken by the Christian missionaries of different varieties. Uh, and and I, I don't think this is uh, uh, related to any way, by any way, to the question of melody and Bengal. But I have noticed another related question. I, I think this can be addressed. Would I, would I, would I, would I relate to that? When was Queen I introduced? One question. I, don't, I, I just can't remember the name. Of uh, the person who has introduced this question. Should I uh, answer? Yes, sir. Of course. of course. Of course. Uh, uh, quinine was introduced in That's India uh, between the period 1890s to 1910. Uh, uh, it was distributed. Uh, by three channels, first by uh, fever dispensaries, then by post offices, and even in the grocery shop. Uh, when the relation between man, mosquito, and malaria was uh, established, and uh, quinine was proved to be the only remed uh, having only remedial properties, uh, quinine used to be produced in uh, Neil Kiri Hills, and in Bengal, particularly, uh, it was produced in uh, Darjeeling Hill area. An experimental quinine production was made in uh, Calcutta Botanical Garden. Ovijin Mukherjee has done an excellent work on that. Uh, the work in corner. So this is my submission mm. about quinine. Uh, and another question about Kobiraju. Whether the Kobirajos were concerned about the infective nature of uh, uh, malarial fever. You know, uh, proper Kabiraju treatment was rather, rather very uh, a rarity during the late 19th century when malaria was uh, taking its ravage. Uh, so the role of Kabiraju is not uh, that distinct, particularly because in the late 19th century, Early 19th century, the Kobirazu was giving efficient services. But since uh, patronization to the Kabiraja's uh, way of treatment was withdrawn by the government during the second half of the 19th century, so the treatment of Kabirajas did suffer. And uh, a true Kabiraja was a rarity during the second half of the 19th century. And those who are practicing in the name of Kabiraja treatment, they used to adulterate quinine. And so the patient, uh, I, mean, I mean, the malarial fever in patient used to linger longer. And there was no uh, proper uh, treatment of uh, malaria by the copyright treatment, so to say. And another, uh, yes, these two questions I could identify from the uh, live comments.
Is there any other question? Sir, there's another question. Sir, there's another okay. question. Mohuam Basu has asked whether, uh, other than quinine, any indigenous medication was used to treat malaria. The usual treatment by the Kabirajo was uh, just stop the patient. You know, there are two methods of uh, indigenous treatment, either bloodletting in such, such, certain cases, they used to uh, allow a uh, late blood or starving. So not be, I mean, the, the relation between malaria and mosquito was established not before 1890s when uh, Ross discovered uh, the relation between uh, mosquito and malaria. Of the 200 variety of mosquito, only one mosquito, that is uh, female anopheles was responsible for, responsible for malarial fever was discovered sometime in 1893. So not before that, we didn't know properly that mosquito was responsible for malaria. So they used to stop patient uh, and uh, a fever mixture was there. Uh, nobody knows what consisted of those, that uh, fever mixture. It was indigenously prepared. Its property is not known, so to say. Only in the beginning of the 19th century, I am reminded of an uh, a famous advertisement uh, made by uh, Shotuji Rai, where he says, Shuki Grihokon, Shuki Gramophone. Along with Gramophone, you can see one bottle of quinine. So that was the remedy during the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century. But during the second half of the 19th century, this fever mixture was there. And secondly, my submission is that nobody knows what was the exact property of that uh, fever mixture. They used to starve person. And this sort of uh, treatment was uh, prevalent. Uh, yeah, for the well, <coughs> any other? Can questions? I speak now, sir? Sure. Sir, can you hear mm -hmm. me? Okay, yeah, sir. I'll add on a very facile note that not only end of nineteenth century. In the middle of the 20th century, also, we had this fever mixture, this inexplicable liquid yeah, which yeah. we were given when we were sick. Uh, I don't know what it is made of. Mm, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I think uh, most of our generation, we are familiar with that fever mixture. And it worked also. <laughs> anyway, sir, thank you for a very interesting share. And I'm sure people thank would you. come up with a lot more questions, which we would relay to you if possible thank sure, you sure, sir sure, sure sure and now thank you, thank uh, you for the question uh, yeah. professor mukherjee professor yes. mukherjee can you hear me yes yes okay professor mukherjee, professor mukherjee there are quite a few questions for you but they are basically the same trisha haldar and um, uh, rito brato goswami onomitra Narayan Sharma, they have asked a couple of questions. Like, first of all, uh, did malaria spread through the introduction of railway lines? Is there any connection between the two? That is question number one. Question number two is that, did the practitioners of Western medicine collaborate with the Kavirajas or indigenous doctors in curing patients uh, in the countryside? That is the second question. Third question is that, did the government, did the state um, provide cholera vaccine to the uh, native as well as to the Indian as well as uh, the uh, European people affected by cholera in India? And the last question is that, that um, was there a quarantine system? I think you have already addressed this question. Was there a quarantine system and uh, whether it led to social stigmatization? These are the questions, basically. OK, thank you very much for asking uh, all these questions. Um, no, about malaria, I did not talk about malaria, isn't it? Um, 
uh, address to Professor Shamante. Anyway, I, uh, this is uh, also falls within uh, the, my area of interest. So, of course, malaria did spread by introduction of railway lines. Uh, actually, there have been a lot of studies uh, which show the connection between uh, spread of malaria uh, in the areas to which, uh, the, through which the railway lines passed. You know, there, uh, and in the 1860s, after coming of the railways, and it, it can be shown, and it was shown during that time also, that uh, malaria became very, very uh, prevalent in those areas to uh, which places the uh, railway lines রবীন্দ্রনাথ যেটা বলছেন যে ইংরেজরা আসার আগে ম্যালেরিয়া ছিল না সে কথাটা মনে হয় পুরোপুরি সত্যি না আমাদের দেশে অথর্ববেদ ম্যালেরিয়া রেফারেন্স আছে সেটা ম্যালেরিয়া এই নামে নেই পাপনন বলছে হ্যাঁ কিন্তু তার যে পিরিয়ডিক ইনভেশন সেটা আছে যেটা যেটা রবীন্দ্রনাথ বলতে চাইছিলেন সম্ভবত এই যে ইট বিকেম অ্যান এপিডেমিক ডিউরিং দ্য কলোনিয়াল পিরিয়ড it was there in the in our morphology it was in a, in an endemic form but it turned out to be an epidemic only with the beginning of the colonial period it was the rubina bolte chaichilen aru je railway ni jeta bolche railway as such malaria er jonno dai noy malaria er jonno dai railway er jonno je embankment that disturbed the natural drainage system jogle eta shokram kore drainage system er jonno deshe kore natural natural flow of water that was disturbed embankment er kole jonno তার তলায় যে ওই যে যাকে আমরা নয়ন জুলি বলি ওগুলো তো পারমানেন্ট এবং ওই জায়গাগুলি হচ্ছে সেই কারণে যাকে বলি নসোলজি সেটাই তো পরে ফিভার আগে তো ফিভার শব্দটা একটা জেনারেল ক্যাটেগরি তার মধ্যে নানান রকম ফিভার তো হ্যাঁ থ্যাংক ইউ So now, uh, can I move on right, to the next question? Sure, sure. Okay. So now, uh, practitioners of Western medicine, did they collaborate with indigenous doctors? Actually, when it is very difficult to uh, say in one or two sentences, give a reply to that. I mean, I'm going to say that there was a lot of stage in our country, British আসার পরে যেভাবে মেডিসিন এবং টোটাল হেলথ কেয়ারটা ডেভেলপ করেছে প্রথম একটা ফেজ আমরা বলতে পারি আমি খুব সিম্পলিস্টিক ওয়েতে বলবো আর কি সেটা হচ্ছে একটা ফেজ অফ কোলাবরেশন ছিল যেটাকে আমরা জানি যে একটা ওয়েরিটালিস্ট ফেজ ছিল ব্রিটিশ রুলে তো সেই পর্বে কিন্তু দেখা যাচ্ছে যে দের ওয়াজ লট অফ আই মিন দ্য ওরিয়েন্টালিস্ট অ্যান্ড দোজ হু আর ইন্টারেস্টেড ইন এনশিয়েন্ট সিস্টেম অফ মেডিসিন দ্য ব্রিটিশ Uh, uh, researchers, they were very interested to know about the indigenous system of medicine. And then they thought that it is good to collaborate and learn from the uh, practitioners of Indian medicine because they would know the local symptoms and they would really prescribe about the remedies. But with progress of time, this attitude anti Uh, uh indian system uh, indian medical system attitude hardened jemon amra jani me call er policy jokhon theke orient mane anglicist phase shuru hoche tokhon kintu bola hocche je eta unscientific je bharotiyo je system of medicine eta unscientific karon ekhane human theory er upore base kore sob ta kora hocche kaje more and more they, there was a gap between uh, the indigenous 
practitioners of indigenous medicine and uh, the uh, practitioners of western medicine so you see the along with the progress of time there was less and less collaboration jeta amra bolbo acha arikta kotha hocche je state did the state provide cholera vaccine to indians and europeans eta ami shesher mention korechi the cholera vaccine ta to eloi ami je porbo ni alochona korchi 1892 1893 कारण ब्रिटिशन होते जोर चापा मैं कि मैं सेक्टर चालू कर हटात कलरा गिस्टेटर कार्यकलाप गो बंध हो जाए टी एस्टेट बामिर मध्य यूरोपियन पपुलेशन मध्य खूब अल्प लिमिटेड वे चालू कर बोधाय आज कोरेंटाइन सिसटेम दिए हुईच आई अलरेडी आंसार जो छवि दिए कोरेंटाइन हाउ कोरेंटाइन मेनटेन इन डिफरेंट एरिया टू लिखे आलोचनार विषय बस्तुर मध्य आसेंगे बजार मेडिसिन तेनाटा हतो अवेलेबल इन दार्केट से इनग्रिडियंट गोडियंट गो पावा फल पा दिए मुखर्जी मन हल आलोचना शुने मन कर निश्चय साधारण मानुष्ट 
দেবদেবীর কাছে আবেদন করতেন স্যার এটা বলেছেন বর্তমানে এসে যখন করোনা একটা ডিজিজ এটা সবাই জানে এবং প্রত্যেক দিন বিভিন্ন প্রচার মাধ্যমে সেটা বলা হচ্ছে কি করা যেতে পারে বা ইত্যাদি নিয়ে বিশদ আলোচনা চব্বিশ ঘন্টা হচ্ছে তখনও কিন্তু করোনাকে একটা দেবী বলে কেউ কেউ ভাবছেন মানে এরম একটা জায়গা কিন্তু আছে মানে এটা মানুষের বিপন্নতাও হতে পারে এইটা একটা মনে হলো আর আরেকটা যেটা এটা স্যার যেটা বলেছেন সেটার সাথে রিলেট করে বলছি আর সুজাতা মুখার্জি যেটা বলেছেন সে ইন্ডিজিনাস ওষুধের ব্যবহার মানে কাজ হতেও পারে নাও হতে পারে সেটা কিন্তু বর্তমানেও হচ্ছে প্রত্যেকে কিন্তু আয়ুর্বেদিক হোমিওপ্যাথিক যে যা মনে করছেন রেমেডি কাজ হলেও হতে পারে এবং সেটা কিন্তু স্টেট লেভেল থেকেও বিতরণ করা হচ্ছে এমন নয় যে তারা ব্যক্তিগত ভাবে কিনে খাচ্ছেন রীতিমতো গ্রামে গ্রামে গিয়ে এগুলো বিতরণ করা হচ্ছে ইন দ্য হোপ যে হয়তো কিছু সুফল পাওয়া যেতে পারে তো আজকে আপনাদের এই বিদগ্ধ আলোচনার থেকে বর্তমান পরিস্থিতিতে বসে আমি দুজনের লেখার থেকে মানে দুজনের বক্তৃতার থেকে আমি এই দুটো জিনিস আমি আমার রিয়েলাইজেশন হলো তো খুব ভালো লাগলো আমি এখন আমাদের হেড অফ দ্য ডিপার্টমেন্ট প্রশান্ত কুমার পালকে বলবো উনি যদি কিছু বলেন অধ্যাপক অধ্যাপিকা মহাশয় তাদের বিধব্ধ আলোচনা এবং যে সমস্ত প্রশ্ন আমরা পেয়েছিলাম সবগুলো কিছু অনেকেই রয়ে গেল আমার মনে হয় সেগুলো হয়তো সময়ের অভাবের জন্য আমরা উত্তর দিয়ে উঠতে পারলাম না স্যারের কাছে আমার যেহেতু একটা সুযোগ হয়েছে এবং ঘরবন্দি অবস্থায় আপনাকে শোনার তো আমি একটা প্রশ্ন করতে চাই আসলে আমরা ধর্ম এবং ধর্মীয় চেতনার সঙ্গে আমরা এপিডেমিক্স কে দেখেছি একাত্ম হয়ে যেতে এবং সেটা আমরা দেখেছি কোনো ধর্মীয় অনুষ্ঠানের সাথে রিচুয়ালের সাথে মিশে গেছে সেটা আরবান এলিট কালচারে হোক বা একটু সাব আরবান বা পেরিফেলাল এরিয়াতে হোক প্রান্তিক এরিয়াতে হোক তো এই এই যে ধর্মের সাথে এপিডেমিক্স এর যে মেলবন্ধন সেটা সেমি আরবান সেমি থিউডাল বা সেমি ক্যাপিটাল একটা সোসাইটিতে ছিল আমরা ধরে নিই যদি রণজিৎ গুহকে সামনে রেখে সেটা বা দীপেশ চক্রবর্তীকে বারবার বলছেন কিন্তু আপনি এই একবিংশ শতকে দাঁড়িয়ে কিভাবে করোনা পুজো হচ্ছে এবং সেই সচেতনতার সাথে করোনা এপিডেমিক্স কে কিভাবে আপনি ব্যাখ্যা করবেন সেই এখন তো আর সেমি ফিউডাল বা সেমি ক্যাপিটাল সোসাইটি নয় একবিংশ শতকে দাঁড়িয়ে আপনি এই এই ব্যাখ্যাটা কিভাবে রাখবেন একটু যদি বলেন আসলে হ্যাঁ খুব ইন্টারেস্টিং প্রশ্ন প্রশান্ত ধন্যবাদ ব্যাপারটা হলো দেখো মানে আমরা যে কোনো ডিজিজ কে যখন দেব দেবী দিয়ে অ্যাড্রেস করছি সেটাকে সবসময় গ্রামের লোকেরা করছে রুরাল এরিয়া কান্ট্রি সাইড এর লোক করছে তা না অন্তত আমি এক একটা ডিটি ধরে ধরে আলোচনা যদি করতে পারি তাহলে দেখা যাবে যে এই উদ্ভব অনেক সময় কিন্তু শহরেও বিশেষ করে কলেরার যে ওলা বেবি ওলাই চন্ডি তার উদ্ভব কিন্তু এই বেরিগাছিয়া বেলেঘাটায় এক সাহেব বলছেন যে তিনি একটা এরকম পাথর দেখেছিলেন সেটা একজন পুজো হচ্ছিল সিঁদুর সিঁদুর মাখিয়ে সামনে ঘর দেখে সেটা সেখানে অনেক জনসমাগম হচ্ছিল দেখে তার জন্য কথা বলছি তিনি বলছেন যে তিনি কিছু টাকা দিয়েছিলেন সেখানে একটা ঘর বানানো হয়েছিল সুতরাং এটা কিন্তু গ্রামের গল্প না একটা শহরের গল্প আমার যেটা মনে হয় ধর্মের সঙ্গে তখন কিন্তু একটা বিজ্ঞানেরও সম্পর্ক ছিল যদি আমরা শীতলার যে ডিটি তার যদি আমরা মূর্তিটা কল্পনা করি শীতলা কিরকম দেখতে তার চার হাত একটা হাতে তার একটা পাখা আছে আটটা হাতে একটা ঝাঁটা আছে কাঁথে একটা কলসি আছে এইগুলো সবই কিন্তু সিম্বলিক আমরা এটাকে আমি যদি এক কথা বলি ইটসেন্টেরাপি 
शीतलार मूर्ति के भाई कथा बोला बसंत शीतला पुजो तो मैं बसंत मान ग्रीष्मकाले ठंडा रखते शरीर के जेनारे आविष्कार रेजिम प्रथम प्रथम सात दिन से निमिष खा एट द एंड अफ सेभन डे से स्नान कर निमे निम पतार विछाना शोबे आपनर फिफ्टीन डे से शीतलार पुजो है खाद्य बोले दे खा एक समय प्रथम सात दिन की खा तर तीन दिन की खा तर तीन दिन की खा एट द एंड अफ फोर्टीन डे से खा खूब स्ट्रिक रेजिमेंट कर देर मध्य क्योंकि कत सायस छो सायस हे शर ठंडा रखते हैं पेटा के निरापद रखते पेट के बावल के बस डिस्टार्ब कर चलोना कारण एम पक्सर समय स्मल पक्सर समय शरीर उइक हो जाए जे कारण टीकार संगे संगे रिलीजियस एक टेंट अफ रिलीजियस रेजिम एखे जुड़े देखा हतो एन जो हेखने क्योंकि सायन्स पुरोपुर मिसिंग एर वैज्ञानिक व्याख्या नहीं तुलसी जंगल तक एने ग्राम लोक गृहस्थ बाड़ी उठने पुत कारण तुलसर अनेक रेमेडियल प्रपार्टीज आज है तरह अनेक पतार अनेक रकम गुण आज है से ही कारण खूब परिष्कार रखार जो तुलसी के देवी कल्पना कर तुलसर स्थान परिष्कारच्छन्न करो से धोआ मछा कर धूप दुना देा हतो तर मान ये एम एक्टा गाच पता है जहाँ प्रचुर रकम रोग रेमेडियल प्रपार्टीज आज है हुई इज भेरि यूजफुल सूतरा एखे एक धर्म दिए जिसटा के सैंशन करा हलो एन जो बेपार हो तुम प्रश्न एखान शुरू कर सम्प्रदायर बे पंचाशाट छवि पंचाशाट जन महिला पता पेटे कला कला पता पेटे सीदुर माखानो कि लाड्डू आटी खुड़े तेज पुजो कर डिशन चलते तो पिछले क्योंकि विज्ञान नहीं पिछले विज्ञान आज क्योंकि आगे विज्ञान गढ़ेड खड़ा कर एपिडेमिक के केंद्र कर पिछले किसान किसान विज्ञान क्योंकि छो से हारिए गई बोध बोझाते पे डर सामंत एंड डर मुखार्जी फॉर योर informative uh, lecture and we are very uh, fortunate that uh, being within the four walls of my house our house actually we have enjoyed uh, this lectures and it is uh, i think the possibilities created uh, due to the coronavirus due to the pandemic situation and this uh, situation made us uh, uh, i think quote unquote jantrik uh 
we were not technologically very sound and it made somehow uh, made us uh, very jantric, technologically sound uh, instead of ojantric. So thank you both of uh, you and uh, dear audience. Uh, formally, I will request Dr. Shorkar, my senior colleague of Department of History of Gokhal Memorial Girls College to give thanks. Over to you, madam. Okay, thank you. Today, it is my pleasure and privilege to deliver the vote of thanks. First of all, we want to acknowledge our deepest debt of gratitude to the speakers, Professor Aurobindo Shamunto and Professor Shujata Mukherjee for giving us so much of their valuable time and for sharing their insights with us to help us understand better the present crisis we are enduring. Next, I wish to thank our principal, Dr. Otoshi Karpa. She's always a source of encouragement to us. We heartily thank our audience and we are humbled by the sheer number of participants who felt it worthwhile to share their to share our first webinar hosting experience. If we have made any mistakes, we are sorry. But as Prashanto pointed out, we were not that tech savvy before, but we are all learning. It's a learning curve for all of us. And we'll do better next time, I'm sure. We were helped in the technological sphere by our junior colleague, Shubham De and Deboshi Chakraborty, while Sri Akash Mondal of Brain Drops helped us in some small ways. We thank our fellow teachers at Book Hill Memorial Girls College and the non-teaching staff as well. And lastly, I, as one of the senior teachers of the department, would like to say a personal thank you to our very young and enthusiastic head of the department, Prashant Kumar Pal, for infusing a degree of energy into our departmental activities. Thank you, everybody, once again, and a good night. Good night. So we are signing off. Thank you. Good night, everybody.